This next song that we're going to do is I'm Standing on the Solid Rock, but first, could you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening, and we thank you for all the people who are here, and for all of those who have used their talents and their gifts that you have provided to them to glorify you. We just hope that tonight hearts will be open and lives will be changed, and it's in your son's precious name that we pray. Would you please stand and sing, I'm standing on the solid rock with us. <laughs>
Are you feeling mighty fine? Yes. All right. We're feeling mighty fine, aren't we up here? All right. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. One, two, one, two, three. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul. Cause I knew the Lord had control. Well, I knew I was walking in the light. Cause I've been on my knees in the night. And I pray the Lord gives a sign. And now I'm feeling mighty fine. Well, I'm feeling, feeling mighty fine. I've got heaven on my mind. Don't you know? So plan to come a little bit early, stick around a little bit later, and visit and make, uh, make some new friends. So that's tomorrow evening, which is, what's the topic Monday evening? Simon Says. <laughs> All right. Haven't you enjoyed night after night having God's Word open and hear it? Hear it explain. Doesn't it just? I think about the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and their hearts—they were their hearts were warm because they heard the Lord Jesus explaining the Scripture. Oh, what an opportunity! Think about the Apostle Paul. Was it two years in the rented in the rented building for two years? Now I know that everybody didn't come every night, but what does it say? 
everyone in the whole area, the whole region, came sometime during that two years to hear the Apostle Paul. Oh my goodness. And from that area, look at all the churches that were started. Oh, there's nothing like God's Word. And you're, you're, you're blessed as the man, blessed as the person who hears the Word of God. Oh my. Well, also remember the t-shirts. Uh, they're five dollars. That's right. It's about the cost on them. And if you don't have the five dollars, go ahead and get you a t-shirt. We would rather have someone wearing the t-shirt out there uh, than have them in a box till next year. And uh, remember that in the first full week of August, tentatively, we'll be over at Weston. That will be in 2017 at the Klein's Opera. Now, there's one nice thing about over Klein's Opera. The seats are cushioned. That's nice. That's nice. So remember that. It's kind of circled on your channel. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, uh, and then in 2018, we'll be back here. And it'll be about the third week in August, tentatively. So just keep those things in mind. All right. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and counsel one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray. Father, what a, a privilege it is to be able to call upon the God of creation as our Father. We thank You for loving us and making it possible for us to be forgiven and to be adopted into Your family, to have our names written in Your book, to have a place prepared in Your house, to be in Your kingdom for all of eternity. We thank you. And tonight, as our hearts rejoice in music, as our hearts and our minds are in tune with you as we hear the Scripture read and explained, Father, we pray that our lives will become a reflection to the world in which we live of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you in His name. Amen. Just a few words before we begin this evening, our last two songs before we hear the message from Dr. Anderson. I want to just let you know how much I appreciate these folks up here. They have been so much fun to work with. They are a great group of Christian people. And I want to say thank you to Sam on drums, John Pash on, on guitar, Kevin Johnson on bass, 
Zach Jennings has been here several nights playing the guitar. Peggy Harmon, Kathleen doing all the words up here. We really appreciate that this year to have the lyrics up on the screen. And you guys over here, we, you guys are awesome. And I appreciate your talents and you sharing them with everyone and all of my leaders. And could you tell we're having any fun up here? <laughs> we have been having a blast all week long, every night. Because I can speak for this man here and all the rest of them, I know they'll let me. We love to use our talents of musicianship for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're up here, we're having fun, we're having a great time. And thank you all for singing with us. I can hear you several times really coming out with a lot of these songs. So stand up one more time, please, if you can, if you're able, and sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And since Jesus came into my heart, take it away, Peggy. Jesus came into my heart. Save 
in that. And uh, this is a, a very familiar passage of Scripture to which we refer now. And so I'd like for you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. You probably can uh, quote most of what we're going to read here, but anyway, uh, it will be a blessing to you. See, John, how you doing? <laughs> The Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, and uh, if you feel like it, try, you can stand as we read this uh, passage of Scripture in honor of the Word of God. If it's not uh, easy for you to stand, don't worry. John 14, beginning with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Be you believe in God, believe even in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. Now I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go you know, and the way you know. But Thomas says to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him, and have seen him. And Philip said, Now Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father who dwells in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works 
sake. And then if we skip on down uh, to verse 27, where he says, Peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let's go to our Lord again in prayer, asking Him to guide our thoughts into His Holy Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the sacred Scripture that is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We thank You for the Holy Spirit who is not only our comforter and the one who gave us new life when we trusted in You by a spiritual birth, but also He's the one who will remind us of the things you have taught us and he will guide us into all truth and working through us will bring glory to your name. So now as we come to the sacred word and the time of preaching, I pray that you'd hide the servant and exalt the Savior. And I pray that you, the inspirer of the words, the giver of the words, that uh, you will guide our thoughts into this word. And if there be those who have never yet understood why they need to be saved and how they can be saved, I pray that you'll make it clear to them and draw them unto you to be saved tonight, to trust in you, turning from their sins in genuine repentance and turning to you in unconditional trust to receive the gift that's provided through atoning work of Christ, the sacrifice that he made in that he bore our burdens in his own body to the tree that we being made righteous in him should live under righteousness and so i pray that you will bring lost souls to trust in you tonight i pray that you will be with christians to be strengthened tonight to be comforted to be guided and to be delivered from whatever it might be that causes one to stumble and that might have tripped them up in some way or another Lord, bless each family, bless each pastor that's here, each Sunday school teacher, each mother and father and grandfather and grandmother and the children and the families and this community and these churches. And we'll thank you in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, one of the hymns, you know, that has been sung here. Uh, more than once during this week has been standing on the promises. Uh, you recall the words perhaps, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of wind and doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing on the promises of Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit sword standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. And the chorus of, uh, is standing on the promises, and he repeats that several times and ends up, I am standing on the promises of God. Well, in this passage of Scripture, you have some very important promises of God. It was made first to the disciples in the upper room, but also because of the inspiration in giving these words and having them recorded uh, by the Apostle John, it's recorded for our benefit as well. And these promises that were made to them are promises that he also makes to us. And wonderful promises they are. We need to stand upon these promises. These were words were made, as we mentioned, in the upper room. It was during the last week of public ministry leading up to the cross, the death, the burial, and then the resurrection on the first day of the next week. The very center of Christian hope rests upon what Jesus did and the promises he made and the power he displayed during this week. 
It is at the Christ who conquered the cross, the only hope people have for deliverance from sin, for victory in their lives, for peace with God, for eternal life. It's the gravitating center of human hope. Because if one is to be saved, he must gravitate by faith to the Christ and conquer the cross. And it was during this week that he promised to do so, and he in fact did. And it's not only the gravitating center of human hope, it's the propellant center of human obligation for having died for us and drawing us unto him and saving by his grace those who trust in him, he sends us out into all the world to be his witnesses, his servants. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. I've said this not here, uh, but uh, before, that you can take the what we call great commission of Christ and put it into one word, to preach. And uh, then it's P-R-E-A-C-H, to preach. And then you knock off the first letter and it says R-E-A-C-H, to reach. And knock off the second letter and it says E-A-C-H, each. And that's our duty, to go into all the world. And he said to these disciples later that after they would be endued with power from on high, they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, their hometown, in Judea, the surrounding countryside, in Samaria, the enemy country, and unto the ends of the earth, around the world. And that's our duty. And really, we should not look at it so much as duty as privilege. It's our opportunity, while he's left us here, to share the good news that have, has come to us with other people and to stand upon the promises. Well, here it was in the upper room. The first day of the week we call Palm Sunday, and that's uh, when he was presented as it uh, was uh, prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures and now fulfilled in this New Testament time. And so we call it Palm Sunday because the Lord had laid upon the heart of some to prepare their burrow and be like your family car and not put it in the barn that night, but tie it up outside. And that was at Big Foggy, we pronounce it Beth Fage, but the house of figs is what it means. And they would do that knowing that uh, the master is going to need the use of that uh, family car, that burrow. And so he told his disciples when he was there in Bethany, he said, now go up to this uh, little village that's opposite us up here, and uh, there's going to be a burrow outside. And you untie him and take him. Wait a minute. The people of the household who see us taking their burrow be like stealing your car. They're, they're, they're going to know why we're doing that. He says, all you have to do is to tell them the master has need of him because their hearts were ready. And God had somehow or another had given to them the, the understanding that uh, their burrow was going to be used by the Lord who would come into town just like Zechariah the prophet had said in chapter 9 of Zechariah verse 9 that uh, your master, your savior, your Lord, the Messiah, he will come riding meekly on the burrow. Now he'll come back riding triumphantly on the white stallion. But this time he's coming to give himself to the excruciating agonies of Calvary's cross to pay the debt of our sins. So he rides meekly. Well, they went up there and they untied the burrow. Sure enough, people came out and they said, what are you doing? Stealing our burrow. What are you doing? And they said, the master has need of him. Oh, they understood. They must have been the very first ones then that went out there as Jesus got on that burrow and started riding up over the Mount of Olives and down through the Kidron Valley and up to Mount of Moriah at Jerusalem. And so they went out there and took their outer garments off and laid them down and prayed for the Master to come as he had been prophesied. And then they didn't have enough car garments and so they tore off branches from the palm trees. That's why we called it Palm Sunday. And then they began to cry as we transliterated, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Now the Hebrew word is two words elided, Hosea, na. Hosea is the word for salvation, like Yahushua means the one who will save in the futuristic tense. And so it is that they cried salvation, and then they used the little particle na, Hosea na, and that means now. Salvation is now! Salvation is now! 
And of course, there were other unbelieving, hypocritical Pharisees that said to the Lord, keep your disciples quiet. They disturb our peace. And he said, if these should be quiet, the stones will cry out. And it wasn't but just a few days that they were quieted out of fear. Even some of the closest denied him. And when the shepherd was being smitten like a sheep that scattered, they went far away. And they feared. And so they were quiet. And the only voices that seemed to clamor out loud were the voices of those enemies of Christ who said, Crucify him! Crucify him! Ah, but the stones cried out when he was hanging upon that cross suspended between heaven and earth, dying in our stead. There was a miraculous darkness that came over at noonday until three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, so it was uh, that uh, he was cloaked by the midnight skies. The, the, the sun and the moon just dared not to look upon that scene of awesome carnage whereas the Savior was bearing our sins in His own body dying on the tree and then there was a mighty earthquake and so mighty it was that the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom and the holiest of holies that were formerly closed off from mankind are now open to the repentant rebels who come to the blood of the Lamb into the very presence of God having access into His holy presence. The stones cried out. So it was on this day before, the night before, that He would be taken. And in the night He would be taken. And the next day would be presented for those mock trials before uh, uh, the Jews and, and Annas and, and uh, Caiaphas and, and then... Uh, Pilate and, and then Herod Antipas and back to Pilate and finally Pilate caves in and lets the Romans take him out and to crucify him and uh, Jesus died for our sins. And the man who was in charge had no doubt won the honors of being in charge of that bloody butchery by showing how stoic he could be when others were in pain and weeping and so he could see death of another without flinching the flesh or batting his eye and there he was in charge but he saw what Jesus had to say he saw how the thief on the cross believed he saw how kind Jesus was and he saw how Jesus even prayed for his persecutors father they don't know what they do forgive them and then when the earthquake and the darkness came and the signs of the miraculous took place around this place, this place just outside the walls of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, this callous Roman soldier said, truly, this was the Son of God, just like he said. Well, it's in the midst of that week, on the evening before he would be uh, crucified, that Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room and he warned them that was going to be a, a, a tragic thing take place. He told them that they would betray him, one of their own. He told them that they would beat him. He told them that they would mock him. He told them they would massacre him, but it was hard for them to grasp that until a little bit later. But he said, I'm going to send you the Comforter. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send you the Comforter. They spoke about the Holy Spirit. And of course, he established the servanthood type of lifestyle that believers should have, not seeking to exalt themselves, but humbling themselves that the Savior might be exalted. And here, the Master washed the disciples' feet. And then he had a Passover meal with his disciples but then he did something else he established what we call communion or the lord's supper where he broke bread and said take eat as he thanked the lord the father for this giving of his body and his life he broke it and then said uh, take eat this is my body it would represent the fact that he is the bread of life for the soul uh, he was not one who gave his flesh to be eaten as a cannibalistic style, 
but he would be one who would satisfy the hunger of the soul and the heart and the mind and life. And he's the bread and uh, partake of this. His body would be broken, beaten, and the nails would pierce the wrist of the hand and the feet and the side would be split wide open later and, and, and uh, blood would flow and his, his disciples needed to know that and that they needed to partake of him. And then he, he took the fruit of the cup and, and never used the word wine in reference to the Lord's Supper. And uh, he never did make a toxic substance and never did drink it. There are a number of different words translated out of the Hebrew into our language as wine. And some of them never, never, never meant a toxic like Kiddush never did. And uh, uh, Chovetz never did. And in the New Testament, uh, we have words that uh, never mean it, like oxus. And when he was on the cross, he was very thirsty. And they brought him a toxic substance, which he refused. Uh, just a little bit on the sponge. Now, if he said it was all right to drink wine, if he made that which is toxic for others to drink, he would have taken it then. But he didn't. But then they brought him the vinegar. You see, uh, while they didn't have refrigeration, they did have means of keeping the wine from becoming a toxic wine. Uh, one of their best ways was boiling it into a sweet must. But they also deoxygenated uh, it, and they also filtered the yeast out of it, but there were different ways. But what they could not do is keep a toxic substance as toxic because they didn't have pasteurization and it would always turn into a vinegar. And they could use the non-toxic to wash out the wounds of the sheep. They could use it as an anesthetic. And they could even use it as an anesthesia for those who are dying. And so Christ could have taken it, but he wouldn't because he wouldn't let us be spoiled into thinking it's all right for us to take this addictive drug, which is a terrible thing, a terrible scourge in America. But anyway, college campuses as well, oh, how terrible it is. But anyway, then they offered him the vinegar. In the Greek, it's oxus. In the Hebrew, it's chometz. And that never, never means toxic. It would be like pure vin uh, cider vinegar. You have the cider and the hard cider and then the pure cider vinegar. They could never keep it from going into a vinegar. That's what they couldn't do. Well, anyway, it was during that time that Jesus is coming to die and giving a testimony and showing purity and righteousness in his own life. Then he says, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Now notice how I translate this. Believe even in me. Not also in the sense of him being a separate entity in life essence. For he, there's one God, one life essence, but a triune manifestation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if you believe in God, you should believe in me. In John 5, 23, it tells us that anybody who claims to honor God cannot do it if they don't simultaneously honor the Son. That's what it says. You can read it, John 5, 23. So those who claim God or pray to God but leave Christ out and dishonor Christ are really not getting through to God either because they're not honoring the Son. A Muslim can say, I believe in Allah, but that Allah is not the God of the Bible because they don't believe in the deity of Christ. Well, that's all extra. That's not what I plan to preach. The point is that in the upper room, Jesus comforted his disciples. He gave them promises to stand upon. And what are some of those promises? First of all, we have the promise of a place. Secondly, we have the promise of a path that leads to that place. Third, we have a perception of knowledge of that person who leads the path to life. And then we also have the perpetual life of everlasting life that he promises. Those are the promises that we've not given in the passage we read in your hearing. Uh, there's the place. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a real place, not just a figment of the imagination. 
not just a sense of uh, uh, euphoria. It's a real place. And the Lord is there having paid for our debt, having been buried, having risen again, having come back and showing himself alive again for 40 days, he ascended back to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. And he's there now at the right hand of the authority on high, overseeing the work of his church by his Holy Spirit within his people's lives. And so he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And he promises, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'm looking forward to that day when the Lord calls me in His presence. Now at my age, it's not going to be too long one way or another. But it may be that uh, uh, I'll escape uh, death and be changed in the twinkling of an eye, which is a different kind of quick death and change, and uh, therefore uh, be called up to meet Him in the air with a new body. Now that's my preference. <laughs> Uh, I'm not looking for the undertaker at all, <laughs> but I am looking for the upper taker. But whichever way God pleases, I want to serve him as long as he gives me life. Uh, it was like Billy Sunday once said. He said, you know, I I'm against the devil and I'm for the Lord. And he says, I'm going to fight the devil as long as i got a fist. I'm going to kick the devil as long as i got a foot. I'm going to fight the devil as long as i got a tooth, and then I'm going to gum him till I die. <laughs> and so we need to be active in the service of God and active in opposing the evil of the world, active in bringing people to the Savior from sin. And uh, then he has a place reserved for us, and he's going to come and receive us unto himself. Now that place is described in the Bible in the most glowing of terms. A place of a new Jerusalem where the walls are jasper, the gates of pearl, and the streets of gold, and there's no need of sun or, uh, or moon or stars by night or sun by day because the Lord is the glory thereof, and the gates open wide to those who know Him as Savior. And that's a wonderful, wonderful place. I remember years ago out in Wichita, Kansas, we uh, would pick up a family and take them to church. Then this one elderly gentleman, he wasn't as old as I am now, but he was an old guy. You know? And one of his favorite songs is, Heaven is a wonderful place, filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face, for heaven is a wonderful, heaven is a glorious, heaven is a wonderful place. And he'd sing that song ever, all the way from the time we'd pick him up till the time we'd arrive at the steps of the church. Heaven is a wonderful place. Well, this is the promise that God gives us here upon which we can stand. Stand upon the promise of a place, a home in heaven that the Lord is preparing for you and me. And I don't know all that is going to look like, but I know of a Lord who could speak into existence the magnificent universe of which this world is only a small part and see the beauty of uh, the trees and the flowers and the grass and the seas and, and the creatures that are here to see that. And he spoke that into existence within six days. I tell you what, he's been nearly 2,000 years doing the interior decorating on my mansion. It's going to be beyond my ability to comprehend until I get there, and then I'll understand. A place, but not only a place, the path that leads there. He says in verse 6, when they want to do it, how are we going to get there? Uh, what's the road map? They didn't have GPS in those days, but GPS doesn't get you to heaven either. But here, he says, I, in verse 6, I am the way. There is a personal way. Now, uh, that was a little hard for me to understand as a, as a kid. But I remember one time G. Christian Wise, who was a very fine missionary and was in charge of what they then called the Gospel Missionary Union. And I remember him saying back in 52, he said, uh, no, 54 it was. Anyway, he said, I was over in a way out place in Africa 
and I wanted to visit a spot where I'd heard about that there were a lot of little pygmies and they hadn't heard the gospel and I found a fellow that knew their language and said he would speak it to them and I said okay how do we get there he said we gotta wait till one of the little pygmies comes out to the market and then they'll take us there and he said he took us back to that dense jungle. There was no path. There was no way. He said that pygmy was the way. And he said, I just feared that my hand might slip off his shoulder and I'd never find my way out. He said, I found out what it meant when a person is the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. You want to get to heaven, you need to be attached by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ because there's no other way. And he says that. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the way and he is the only way. You can uh, have riches. They won't buy a path into heaven. They won't buy a car that can get there or a plane or so one of these Sputnik, Mutniks or whatever they also want to call them. It's not going to get you there. You can do a lot of good deeds, but our best, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in this sight and our merit cannot get us there. Uh, ceremonies, they have meaning only if they have a reality to symbolize. But uh, you can be baptized, you can be churchized, you can be homogenized and not get to heaven. <laughs> but if you trust in Jesus, you can get there because He is the way that leads to heaven. Then, Not only did he promise a path that leads to heaven, but he promised a perception by which we could understand truth. He said, I'm the way, and I am the truth. Now, all genuine truth proceeds from the truth that God has established, but there's a lot of lies, a lot of deception, a lot of misunderstandings that are in this world. And some people have great understanding of certain things, nuclear fusion for instance, great understanding of mechanical things, great understanding of uh, airplanes and technology and computers and, and the like, who don't have understanding of why they're here or where they're headed. And so the Bible says they don't really have the foundation for knowledge. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1 9 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or the proper use of that knowledge for practical uses and purposes and so a person can be smart enough to uh, to get a Pulitzer Prize smart enough to be the uh, highest graduate in his class in high school or college or uh, seminary or university but with all that knowledge if he doesn't related to the Creator and to the foundation and to the reason we're here and where we're headed, that knowledge is not going to do a bit of good. He will die without hope. He who hath not the Son of God hath not life. A person who might have uh, learned how to make a lot of money and <laughs> be very, very profitable. He, he might be the richest man in the world. But he's going to leave it all behind and go not to heaven if he doesn't know Christ. Jesus said, what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world but lose his own soul? No, that's not the knowledge that is going to save. The knowledge that saves is the knowledge of the Lord. That's why Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in the, the, uh, the Gospel of John, for instance, in chapter 17 and in verse 3, he says, Father, to know thee is to have life. So we need to know him. That's the perception that we can realize when we know Jesus, the creator, and know the truth that can set us free. But there's another promise here. Not only promise of a place, heaven, 
of a path that leads to heaven, of a perception that realizes the truth about God in heaven, but also here is a promise of the life of God. Not just a physical, mortal life, but an <laughs> eternal, spiritual life with the Father, perpetual life. He promised life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the book of Ephesians, it tells us in chapter 2 that you who were dead in sin are made alive in Christ. And it tells us how. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are created in Christ Jesus unto or for the purpose of good works, the very next verse says, verse 10. And so he says that a person can be physically alive but spiritually dead. And, and so you don't have life until you have life with God. For his life is eternal and the physical life is temporal. It's appointed under this body, this man wants to die. And then after that, to face the judgment. And there is a second spiritual death for which there is no remedy if one has not trusted in Christ. We who have physical life without Christ are spiritually dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and sins have come to have life through Jesus Christ. So without Christ, we are living dead. With Christ, we have eternal life and more to come. So he promises something we can stand upon. We can stand upon the promise of this place he's preparing. We can stand upon the promise of this path that he has given. We can stand upon the promise of this perception that he provides. And one day, we who see through a glass darkly will then see him face to face. And then we'll know as we're presently known how much does God know about me? Everything. How much does He know about you? Everything. And one day we will know all about Him. Now we know in part. And now it is a struggle physically and mentally to grow in the grace and knowledge of God, which is our duty. But one day it will be perfected. It will be completed. That positional sanctification that requires effort for practical sanctification will one day be a perfected sanctification. And we will have a new body made like a new glorified body. We'll have a mind that's complete with the knowledge and truth that God has established. And that's His promise that we can stand upon. So one other thing here. We can stand not only upon the place the promise of a place, stand upon the promise of a path, stand upon the promise of a perception, and stand upon the promise of a, uh, a preserved life. But more than that, or, or in addition to that, we can stand upon the promise of peace. Peace with God. Now what is peace? Peace is an unbroken relationship. Where there is no peace, there is a broken relationship. And Ephesians chapter 2, to refer to that chapter again, by the way, tells us He is our peace who has broken down the middle wall of partition. He spans the gap of, that sin has made between us and God and gives us a bridge of reconciled relationship where we have peace with God. And then verse 27 here, He said, uh, Peace... I give it to you. And then he contrasts that with the false peace that the world promises. Peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. He lived in a world that was controlled by the Roman power and government. And they would march forth with a banner that said Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Uh, he caught under our banner and uh, you will be peaceful. You won't have to have war anymore. Everything will be nice and rosy. Of course, it didn't work out that way. But Jesus said it wouldn't work out that way. The peace that man offers is not a lasting, permanent, genuine peace. It's the peace that God offers that's real. Those who know not the Lord may have momentary respite. They may have times in which they feel they're very comfortable and peaceful. But the Bible makes it clear, like in Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21, for instance. 
where it says the wicked are like the troubled sea that cast up mire and dirt without resting. And he says, there is no peace, saith my God, under the wicked. But Isaiah also was to tell us in Isaiah 26.3, I will give him perfect peace who rests in me. So he gives us something to stand upon here, a peace to enjoy, a relationship where we know that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Our guilt is blotted out and our names are retained in that book of life which he provides through his atoning death and dying for the sins of the whole world. Now, real quickly, why you really can trust these promises. Because of his person, because of his power, because of his products, and because of his prospects. Real quickly, it was not just a human, a king, a ruler who made this promise. It was God himself. He said, I am the father of one, not only here, but in John 10, 30, perhaps even more clearly there. And in John 10, 37 and 38, at the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, he said, uh, if you don't want to believe what I say, observe what I do. My works bear witness of me that truly I'm of the Father. So it's not a promise of a man. It's the promise of God. It wasn't the promise of of a politician who might intend to do what they promise. Most of them, I don't, well, uh, forget that. Uh, some promise things that they don't intend. I, I'm convinced of that. Some promise things that they intend, but they're not able to carry it out. But one thing about the Lord Jesus, he never promised anything he didn't intend to fulfill. He never promised anything that he could not fulfill, and he didn't promise anything that he would not fulfill. That makes this different than the promises of men. It's the promise of the person of God. But secondly, it's the promise of one who had power to fulfill it. As in this life, he showed power to raise people up from the dead, like the son of the widow of Nain, like Nazareth, and like in his own case. He showed that power that men do not have. Therefore, you can stand upon a promise. And also, the products. He produces the peace in our hearts. He produces the joy in our lives. He produces the power in us that we might fulfill His purpose for our lives. Like He said to the disciples, Abide in Me, because without Me, you can do nothing. That's mentioned in the very next chapter of the Gospel of John as He walked through the streets of Jerusalem. And then the... Apostle Paul learned these things that he says in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You probably heard that song. It was very popular for a while and you don't hear it much anymore. But it was, uh, nothing <laughs> is impossible when you put your trust in God. Well, that was written by Eugene Clark. I was preaching in a, in a youth camp up at Marquette, Nebraska. And that's a number of years ago. And there were 600 young people out there, and, and so uh, many accepted the whole time. And then uh, the uh, director of the camp came to me, uh, and he said, uh, there's a person that wants to talk to you. And I said, well, don't come over. He said, he can't do it. Why can't he? He said, well, he has a crippling arthritis, and he's in a, in a, uh, a trailer out, outside. And, and he's been listening to you. And I said, were you listening? I didn't know that they were doing just like you were streaming and people uh, around the world can, can see us and hear us and, and so th they could hear that. And so I went over there and I said, who is it again? And he said, Eugene Clark. I said, you mean the great Eugene Clark? Yes, yeah, that's who it was. He was the one who used to, uh, um, to uh, compose all the music for uh, Back to the Bible and their choir and their quartet. And he would arrange that. He, he played the organ and all oh, beautiful uh, the, uh, player. But, but I went over there and he had this crippling arthritis. He, he couldn't even get up without help. And uh, he said uh, he was still composing music. And my eyes must have kind of blinked. He said, you don't believe me. I said, no, I didn't say I didn't believe me. He said, yeah, but you didn't. He said, I could tell by your face. And he said to his wife, he says, honey, let's show him how we can do this. 
And so his wife had they had an old dictaphone. This remember a number of years back. And uh, she put that in his hand, and all he could do was press the button. And he gave a poem right there that the Lord had laid upon his heart. Well, of course, uh, a poet, a poem has a meter, and that would fit in with uh, like musical meter in the in a uh, what do we call that a, a uh, whatever that is <laughs> on a musical uh, piece of paper. And uh, anyway. He said, let's put this in 3-4 timing. So that was the meter that they would use. It would fit the words that he said. And then, uh, from his mind, he thought of a melody line. And he gave notes to go with those words. Then he went back and gave secondary, third and fourth notes to make it four-part harmony. And he knew the chordal structure of, of music which has its relationship and dominance, subdominance, and all of this. And uh, he wrote a beautiful hymn right there as I was listening, and then someone else would write it down on a musical sheet. And that's the way he wrote that song. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. And the Lord makes all things possible that he wants to accomplish in our lives if we are only yielded unto him and we can do all things to Christ who strengthens us so we can trust these promises because of the person who made them we can trust these promises because of the power to fulfill them and we can trust these promises because of the products he creates through them and we need to say let not your heart be troubled but also finally we can trust these because of his prospect in the future that he has for us. You'll notice there, he said in verse 3 of John 14, I will come again. I'm coming back. And he's promised to take us home. He promises to call us into his presence. He promises to give us that new body. So let's stand upon the promises of God. Well, it's... Uh, impossible to stand upon the promises if we're sitting on our premises. <laughs> Let's stand together and bow our heads and look to our Lord in prayer as our musicians come. Walking this aisle doesn't say shaking the hand of the pastor here or another pastor in the audience or my hand. That doesn't say. It's trusting the Lord that saves. And it may be that it's not quite clear to you and you need counsel. It may be that you want someone to pray with you, to help you as you call upon the Lord in prayer, to trust in Him as your Savior. Or it may be as a Christian, you've not been uh, serving Him well and you want to have victory in your life and, and you like to have prayer, then you come and meet the pastors here in front and let them know. Otherwise, you can trust the Lord where you are and then come and let the world know about it, starting with this group here who would be thankful and grateful for you coming to the Lord and receiving His blessing. So shall we pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to sing this hymn, as we invite people to you, this is the most important part of the service tonight where people make decisions. We pray that they'll not make wrong decisions. We pray that they'll not turn down your offer or turn away from your love, but will turn to you. And Lord, I thank you that you have said, come unto me and I will give you rest. And you said, he who comes to me, I will no wise cast out. And so as you burden their hearts and call upon them, may they realize that yes, they can be saved. Yes, they can be strong. Yes, they can serve. As you call, you provide. And may we stand upon those promises tonight. And we'll thank you for it in the name that's above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. As we sing. Um.
Because I've seen everything.